Well, our topic for today is, is faith in God reasonable? By way of introduction, back in uh, 1966, on April 8th, Time Magazine carried a lead story for which the cover of the magazine was completely black, except for three words emblazoned in bright red letters against the dark background. And the words read, is God dead? And the article described the movement then current among American theologians to proclaim the death of God. But to paraphrase Mark Twain, it seems that the news of God's demise was greatly exaggerated. <laughs> For at the same time that the theologians were writing God's obituary, a new generation of young philosophers was rediscovering his vitality. This was something new and altogether unanticipated. You see, back in the 1940s and 50s, it was widely believed among philosophers that talk about God is literally meaningless. Since God talk is not verifiable through the five senses, it was thought to be cognitively empty. The collapse of this verificationism was undoubtedly the most important philosophical event of the 20th century. With the collapse of verificationism, there came a resurgence among philosophers of interest in metaphysics, along with many other traditional questions of philosophy, which had been suppressed by verificationism. And accompanying this resurgence came something new and completely unexpected, namely a renaissance in Christian philosophy. The turning point probably came in 1967 with the publication by Alvin Plantinga of his book, God and Other Minds, in which he applied the tools of analytic philosophy to questions in philosophy of religion with a rigor and creativity uh, that was new. In his train has followed a host of Christian philosophers, writing in the finest professional journals and participating in the professional philosophical societies, publishing with the finest academic presses. And the face of Anglo-American philosophy has been transformed as a result. Atheism, though probably still the dominant position at the university, is now a philosophy in retreat. In a recent article, the University of Western Michigan philosopher Quentin Smith laments what he calls the de-secularization of academia that evolved in philosophy departments since the late 1960s. Complaining of naturalist passivity in the face of the wave of intelligent and talented theists entering academia today, Smith concludes, and I quote, God is not dead in academia. He returned to life in the late 1960s and is now alive and well in his last academic stronghold, philosophy departments. <laughs> this renaissance in Christian philosophy has been accompanied by a resurgence of interest in natural theology which is the branch of theology that is devoted to uh, arguments for the existence of God, apart from the resources of authoritative divine revelation. All of the traditional arguments for God's existence, such as the cosmological, teleological, moral, ontological arguments, as well as creative new arguments, find today intelligent and articulate defenders on the contemporary philosophical scene. Now, some of you might be thinking, what about the new atheism represented by people like Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens and uh, Sam Harris? Doesn't this herald a reversal of this trend? Well, not really. 
as is evident from the authors that they interact with, or rather I should say fail to interact with, the new atheism is in fact a pop cultural phenomenon, lacking in intellectual muscle and blissfully ignorant of the revolution that has transpired in uh, philosophy over the last 50 years. It tends to reflect the scientism of a bygone generation rather than the contemporary intellectual scene. Now, as a professional philosopher, I believe that the hypothesis that God exists explains a wide range of the data of human experience. And this morning, I would like to briefly mention eight. And I will give condensed versions of these arguments so as to allow maximal time for discussion. Number one, then, God is the best explanation why anything at all exists. Suppose that you were hiking through the forest and came across a ball lying on the ground. You would immediately wonder how it came to be there. If your hiking buddy said to you, oh, just forget about it, it, it just exists inexplicably, you'd either think that he was joking or that he just wanted you to keep moving. Nobody would take seriously the idea that the ball just exists without literally any explanation. Now, notice that merely increasing the size of the ball, even until it becomes coextensive with the universe, does nothing to provide or remove the need for an explanation of its existence. So, what is the explanation of the universe? Whereby the universe, I mean all of space-time reality. The explanation of the universe can only be found in a transcendent reality beyond the universe, beyond space and time, which is metaphysically necessary in its existence. Now, there's only one way that I can think of to get a contingent entity like the universe from a necessarily existing cause. And that is if the cause is a personal agent who can freely choose to create a contingent entity. And therefore, it follows that the best explanation of the existence of the contingent universe is a transcendent personal being, which is what everybody means by God. Now, we can summarize this reasoning as follows. Premise one, every contingent thing has an explanation of its existence. Two, if the universe has an explanation of its existence, that explanation is a transcendent personal being. Three, the universe is a contingent thing. Now, what follows logically from those three premises? Well, four, therefore the universe has an explanation of its existence, and five, therefore the explanation of the universe is a transcendent personal being which is what everybody means by God. Number two, God is the best explanation of the origin of the universe. We have pretty strong evidence today that the universe is not eternal in the past, but had an absolute beginning a finite time ago. In 2003, Three cosmologists, Arvin Moore, Alan Guth, and Alexander Vilenkin, were able to prove that any universe, which is on average in a state of cosmic expansion throughout its history, cannot be infinite in the past, but must have a past space-time boundary. What makes their proof so powerful is that it is independent of any physical description of the early universe. Since we don't yet have a quantum theory of gravity, scientists are not able to provide a physical description 
of the first split second of the universe's existence. But the bohr guth vilenkin theorem is independent of any <coughs> physical description of that moment. Their theorem implies that the quantum vacuum state, which may have characterized the early universe, which some scientific popularizers have inaccurately and misleadingly referred to as nothing, that quantum <coughs> vacuum state cannot be infinite in the past, but must have had an absolute beginning. Even if our universe is just a tiny part of a so-called multiverse composed of many universes, their theory implies that the multiverse itself must have had an absolute beginning. Now, of course, highly speculative scenarios, such as loop quantum gravity, um, string models, even closed time-like curves have been suggested uh, as a way to try to avoid this absolute beginning. All of these models, however, are fraught with problems, but the bottom line is that even if true, none of these models succeeds in restoring an eternal past. Last spring at Cambridge University, at a conference celebrating the 70th birthday of Stephen Hawking, Alexander Vilenkin delivered a paper entitled, Did the Universe Have a Beginning? In which he surveyed current cosmology with regard to that question. And he argued, and I quote, none of these scenarios can actually be past eternal. He concluded, all the evidence we have says that the universe had a beginning. But then the inevitable question arises, why did the universe come into being? What brought the universe into existence? There must have been a transcendent cause which brought the universe into being. And we can summarize this argument thus far as follows. Premise one, the universe began to exist. Two, if the universe began to exist, then the universe has a transcendent cause, from which it follows logically, therefore, three, the universe has a transcendent cause. Now, what sort of entity could this be? Well, by the very nature of the case, that cause must be a transcendent, immaterial being beyond space and time. Now, there are only two types of things that I can think of that could possibly fit that description. Either an abstract object, like a number, or else an unembodied mind or consciousness. But abstract objects don't stand in causal relations. Uh, the number seven, for example, has no effect upon anything, from which it therefore follows that the cause of the universe is plausibly an unembodied mind. <coughs> and thus we are brought not merely to a transcendent cause of the universe, but to its personal creator. Number three, God is the best explanation of the applicability of mathematics to the physical world. Philosophers and scientists have puzzled over what physicist Eugene Wigner has called the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. How is it that a mathematical theorist like Peter Higgs can sit down at his desk and by poring over mathematical equations predict the existence of a fundamental particle which 30 years later after investing millions of dollars and thousands of man hours experimentalists are finally able to discover. Mathematics is the language of nature. But how is this to be explained? If mathematical objects are abstract entities causally isolated from the universe, <coughs> then the applicability of mathematics to the physical world 
is, in the words of the philosopher of mathematics, Mary Lang, a happy coincidence. On the other hand, if mathematical objects are just useful fictions, then how is it that nature is written in the language of these fictions? The naturalist has no explanation for the uncanny applicability of mathematics to the physical world. By contrast, the theist has a ready explanation. When God created the universe, he created it on the pattern of the mathematical structure that he had in mind. And thus, mathematics is applicable to the physical world. We can summarize this argument as follows. One, if God did not exist, the applicability of mathematics uh, to the physical world would be a happy coincidence. Two, the applicability of mathematics is not a happy coincidence, from which it follows three, therefore God exists. Number four, God is the best explanation of the fine-tuning of the universe for intelligent life. In recent decades, scientists have been stunned by the discovery that the initial conditions of the Big Bang were fine-tuned for the existence of intelligent life with a precision and delicacy that literally defy human comprehension. This fine-tuning is of two sorts. First, when the laws of nature are expressed as mathematical equations, you find appearing in them certain constants. For example, the gravitational constant. These constants are independent of the laws of nature. Secondly, in addition to these constants, there are certain arbitrary quantities which are simply put in as initial conditions on which the laws of nature then operate. For example, the amount of entropy uh, in the early universe fall into an extraordinarily narrow range of life-permitting values. Were these constants or quantities to be altered by even a hair's breadth, the balance would be destroyed and life would not exist anywhere in the cosmos. Now there seem to be three live explanatory options for this extraordinary fine-tuning. Either physical necessity, chance, or design. Physical necessity, however, is not a plausible explanation because the finely tuned constants and quantities are independent of the laws of nature, and therefore they are not physically necessary. So, could the fine-tuning be due to chance? Well, the problem with this alternative is that the odds of a life-permitted universe governed by our laws of nature are just so infinitesimal that they cannot be reasonably faced. And therefore, the proponents of chance have been forced to postulate the existence of a world ensemble of other universes, preferably infinite in number and randomly ordered, undetectable by us, so that life-permitting universes would appear by chance somewhere in the ensemble. Now, not only is this hypothesis, to borrow uh, Richard Dawkins' phrase, an unparsimonious extravagance, but it also faces what appears to be an insuperable objection, which has been well explained by Roger Penrose of Oxford University. What Penrose points out is that by far, most of the observable universes in a world ensemble would be worlds in which a single brain fluctuates into existence out of the quantum vacuum and observes its otherwise empty world. And thus, if our world were just a random member of a world ensemble, 
then it is overwhelmingly more probable that we should be having observations like that. Since we don't, that strongly disconfirms the world ensemble hypothesis. So chance is also not a good explanation. It therefore follows logically that design is the best explanation of the fine tuning. And thus the fine tuning of the universe constitutes evidence for the existence of a cosmic designer. Number five. God is the best explanation of intentional states of consciousness in the world. Philosophers are puzzled by states of intentionality. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, intentionality is the property of being about something or of something. It signifies the object directedness of our thoughts. For example, I can think about my summer vacation, or I can think of my wife. No physical object has this sort of intentionality. A chair, or a stone, or a glob of tissue like the brain is not about or of other things. A materialist philosopher like Alex Rosenberg recognizes this fact. And so he concludes that on atheism, there really are no intentional states. Rosenberg boldly claims that we never really think about anything. But this seems incredible, for surely I'm thinking about Rosenberg's argument. And this seems to me to be the reductio ad absurdum of atheism. By contrast, on theism, since God is a mind, it's hardly surprising that there should also exist finite minds. And thus, intentional states fit comfortably within a theistic worldview. And so, we may argue, one, if God did not exist, intentional states of consciousness would not exist. Two. But intentional states of consciousness do exist, from which it follows logically three, therefore God exists. Number six. God is the best explanation of objective moral values and duties in the world. In moral experience, we apprehend moral values and duties that impose themselves as objectively binding and true. For example, we all recognize that it is morally wrong to walk into an elementary school with an automatic weapon and to shoot little boys and little girls and their teachers. But on a naturalistic worldview, there's nothing really wrong with this. Moral values on atheism are just the subjective byproducts of biological evolution and social conditioning. Rosenberg, for example, is brutally honest about the implications of his atheism. He declares, and I quote, there is no such thing as morally right or wrong. Individual human life is meaningless and without ultimate moral value. We need to face the fact that nihilism is true. By contrast, the theist grounds objective moral values and duties in God and his commandments. And thus the theist has the explanatory resources which the atheist lacks to ground objective moral values and duties. Hence, we may argue, one, objective moral values and duties exist. Two, but if God did not exist, then objective moral values and duties would not exist, from which it follows logically, three, therefore, God exists. 
Number seven, God is the best explanation of the historical facts about Jesus of Nazareth. The historical person, Jesus of Nazareth, was by all accounts a remarkable man. New Testament historians have reached something of a consensus that Jesus came on the scene with an unprecedented sense of divine authority, the authority to stand and speak in God's place. That's why the Jewish leadership instigated his crucifixion on the charge of blasphemy. He claimed that in himself, the kingdom of God had arrived. And as visible demonstrations of this fact, he carried out a ministry of miracle working and exorcisms. But the supreme confirmation of his radical claims was his resurrection from the dead. If Jesus really did rise from the dead, then it would seem that we have a divine miracle on our hands, and thus evidence for the existence of God. Now, I appreciate that most people think that the resurrection of Jesus is something you just believe in by faith or not. But you might be surprised to learn that there are actually three established facts which are recognized by most historians today, which I believe are best explained by the resurrection of Jesus, namely his empty tomb, his post-mortem appearances, and the very origin of the disciples' belief in his resurrection. Let me just look very briefly at each one of these. First, fact number one, Jesus' tomb was found empty by a group of his women followers on the Sunday morning after his crucifixion. According to Jakob Kramer, who is an Austrian uh, specialist, and I quote, by far, most scholars hold firmly to the reliability of the biblical statements about the empty tomb, end quote. According to the Dutch New Testament historian D.H. Van Dalen, it is very difficult to object to the empty tomb on historical grounds. He says, those who do so, do it on the basis of theological or philosophical assumptions. Fact number two, on separate occasions, different individuals and groups of people on different occasions and under a variety of circumstances experienced appearances of Jesus alive after his death. According to Gaut Ludemann, who is a prominent German New Testament critic, and I quote, it may be taken as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ, end quote. These appearances were witnessed not only by believers, but also by skeptics, unbelievers, and even enemies of the early Jesus movement. Fact number three, the earliest disciples suddenly and sincerely came to believe in the resurrection of Jesus despite having every predisposition to the contrary. Just Think of the situation that these disciples faced following Jesus' crucifixion. Number one, their leader was dead. And Jewish messianic expectations included no idea of a Messiah who, instead of triumphing over Israel's enemies, would be shamefully executed by them as a criminal. Second, Jewish beliefs about the afterlife precluded anyone's rising from the dead to glory and immortality before the general resurrection of the dead at the end of the world. Nevertheless, the original disciples suddenly and sincerely came to believe that God had raised Jesus from the dead despite having every predisposition to the contrary. How is this to be explained? Luke Johnson, who is a New Testament scholar at Emory University, says, some sort of powerful, transformative experience is required to generate 
the sort of movement earliest Christianity was. And N.T. Wright, who is a prominent British scholar, concludes, that is why, as a historian, I cannot explain the rise of early Christianity unless Jesus rose again, leaving an empty tomb behind him. Attempts to explain away these three great facts, like the, the disciples stole the body, or Jesus wasn't really dead, have been universally rejected by contemporary scholarship. The fact is that there just is no plausible naturalistic explanation of these facts. And therefore, it seems to me, the Christian is amply within his rights in believing that a God raised Jesus from the dead and that he therefore was who he claimed to be. But that entails that God exists. Thus, we may summarize this consideration as follows. There are three established facts about Jesus. His empty tomb, his post-mortem appearances, and the origin of his disciples' belief in his resurrection. Two, the hypothesis God raised Jesus from the dead best explains these facts. Three, the hypothesis God raised Jesus from the dead entails that God exists. Four, therefore, God exists. And thus we have a good inductive argument for the existence of God from the resurrection of Jesus. Finally, number eight, God can be personally known and experienced. Now this isn't really an argument for God's existence, and hence there will be no premises with this slide. Rather, this is the claim that you can know that God exists wholly apart from arguments, simply by personally experiencing him. Philosophers call beliefs like this properly basic beliefs. They aren't based on some other beliefs. Rather, they're part of the foundations of a person's system of beliefs. Other properly basic beliefs would include belief in the reality of the past or reality of the external world around us. In exactly the same way, God is for those who seek him a properly basic belief grounded in the experience of God. Now, if this is so, then there's a danger that arguments for God's existence could actually distract our attention from God himself. The Bible promises, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. We mustn't so focus on the external arguments that we fail to hear the inner voice of God speaking to our own hearts. For those who listen, God becomes a personal reality in their lives. So, in summary then, we've seen eight respects in which I think God provides a better explanation of the data of human experience than does atheism. God is the best explanation of why anything at all exists. God is the best explanation of the origin of the universe. God is the best explanation of the applicability of mathematics to the physical world. God is the best explanation of the fine tuning of the universe for intelligent life. God is the best explanation of intentional states of consciousness in the world. God is the best explanation of objective moral values and duties in the world. God is the best explanation of the historical facts concerning the resurrection of Jesus. And finally, God can be personally known and experienced. For all of these reasons and more, I think that we have a powerful cumulative case for the existence of God. And for that reason, I, along with an increasing number of other philosophers, am enthusiastically a Christian theist. Yes, let me go back to that on the on the PowerPoint so that we can have it up here. Whoops. <coughs> okay. Now that's a very interesting claim. Um, how do we know that not the mathematics and the applicability of it isn't just comparing to the universe the way people actually 
Yeah. I guess I don't think that that would do anything to explain why that's the case. I mean, why is it that mathematics would be inherent to the universe if you think that it's physically necessary? I mean, it doesn't seem to me that the universe would have to be built on so complex a mathematical structure. I mean, don't you think it's very conceivable that you, the universe would not be, would not have the mathematical sort of structure that it does. That, that seems to me intuitively obvious. But even if that weren't possible, it's, it, it seems to me one could, would still want to know well, why is there this physical reality endowed with this rich mathematical structure? So I, I guess to me it seems to cry out for some sort of explanation. Well, um, it seems to me that I can't think of any other explanation that would be as plausible. Uh, I mean, if somebody is willing to come up with one, that's fine, and I, I'm willing to entertain that. But if you think of atheism versus theism, if you have a, a mind which has created the universe, it's so easy to explain why we have the mathematical structure it does. But if there is no mind, behind the universe, then why in the world would this physical world endowed with this incredibly complex mathematical structure exist? I, I just can't think of any explanation that the naturalist might offer, nor have I seen one in the literature. I, I mean, when you read the literature on Wigner's question of the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics, people seem to just shrug their shoulders or throw up their hands. There, there isn't any explanation, it seems to me, on atheism. Okay. Yes? Um, okay, so on this question of math, um, so could we not just say that math itself is, is sort of, um, it's a mental construct, it's a sort of formulated useful pattern that exists in our mind and we just use it? Um, or rather, it, it's a sort of consequence um, uh, that, of our own cognition of it. Right. Sort of like we see right. And yeah, I actually like that view. I contrasted two views in the talk. What's called Platonism, which thinks that these mathematical objects are real things beyond space and time, causally isolated from the universe. And in that case, it's difficult to see how they would have any connection with the physical world. The other view, which I think you've described, would be fictionalism or some kind of anti-realism. Uh, and in that case, the question is, the one I pose, why is it then that the language, or that nature is written in the language of these fictions? Uh, why is reality endowed with that rich physical structure? Certainly you can say that we have it in our concepts, and I think that's right. You don't need to be a realist about these objects. But nevertheless, it's indisputable that physical reality is structured in line with these fictions, whatever they are. And it, it doesn't have to be that way to go back to the first fellow's question. I mean, think of the different geometries. There are lots of non-Euclidean geometries and different topologies that could have characterized the world. So this seems to be a contingent fact about the way the world is that just is a brute fact on naturalism. Yes, way in the back. It seems to me that the first six arguments, they don't really argued the existence of God now, they argued the existence of a creationist. That's how he created the world and all these things. Yeah. But it doesn't really prove that God exists now. And it doesn't make faith in God now a reasonable life. That's a good question. Uh, I don't think that's true of this first argument. This is called the argument from contingency. It drives you back to a metaphysically necessary being which is the explanation for why there is any contingent reality at all. A necessary being is a being whose non-existence is impossible. A contingent being is a being that exists but doesn't have to exist. Its non-existence is possible. Now, if you arrive at a metaphysically necessary being, then clearly it cannot have ceased to exist. In that case, it would, it would be contingent, not necessary. So this argument gets you to a metaphysically necessary being, which must exist now. Now, with respect to the second argument, you're quite right. 
that there's nothing in this argument that says that this creator, <coughs> of, personal creator of the universe is still around today. But think about it for a moment. This is a being which transcends space and time, which created all matter and energy and the laws of nature that govern it. What could possibly make it cease to exist? It, it has power over the entire universe, over space and time themselves, matter and energy. So the idea that this creator is still around, I would say, is a pretty safe bet. Uh, I, I certainly wouldn't bet that he has expired in the meantime. And then, of course, when you couple this with all the other arguments, you get a cumulative case, as I say, for uh, the existence of God now. Yes, so I was just going back to the Higgs boson. Suppose that that collision was actually a universe of itself. And if we made that happen, that doesn't mean that we have control of what happens after the creation of that universe. If you suppose that the actual collision made a universe. Yes. Now, if I understand your question correctly, you're imagining a finite being which manipulates matter and energy and the laws of nature so as to bring about a collision in, in a mini universe or something. But that's not what this argument drives you back to. This drives you back to a being which has created space-time. The Borguth-Vilenkin theorem implies that there is a past boundary to space-time. All matter and energy come into existence at that point, as well as space and time. So this cause is utterly transcendent. It's not like your manipulator who makes these little bangs and could expire. So I, as I say, I certainly wouldn't bet on this thing having passed away. It, it seems to me something that powerful, that transcendent, in creating the universe will, will still be around. Yes, down here. In terms of uh, contemporary science and mathematics, um, uh, definitely not to be the uh, original, but for Christian um, theologians and um, people who are just well knowledgeable in terms of the Bible, mathematics and science says that with respect to our galaxy alone and the expanding universe that there has to be other intelligent life forms. This isn't a suffice to say that there is, but mathematically speaking, there should be. Um, how do you have a reconciliation between the two, both the biblical um, interpretation of humans being the only life form and then the possibility yeah. of... Oh, well, I, I guess, first of all, I would disagree with your Assumption, I don't think there's anything in the Bible that suggests that we're the only intelligent life forms in the cosmos. I, I would defy anyone to quote me a Bible verse that says that there isn't intelligent life on other planets. So I am completely open theologically to the evidence for that. But then secondly, I would want to question what you said about the mathematical probability that there exists intelligent life elsewhere in the cosmos. From all that I've read, the notion that there is intelligent life of comparable information processing capability as homo sapiens is so improbable that it's unlikely to have happened on any planet, anywhere in the observable universe. So that there, according to Barrow and Tipler in their book, The Anthropic Cosmological Principle, they say that there is a consensus today among evolutionary biologists that the complexity of carbon-based intelligent life like ours is so uh, improbable that we are alone, that it's unlikely to have evolved anywhere else in the cosmos. And that's why we've not had any contact with extraterrestrial beings. So while I'm open to this theologically, from what I read about evolutionary biology, the odds are that we're all there is. Suppose, suppose um, if you hear me for a moment, that we find another um, yeah. intelligent life form. In, in the beginning of the Bible, it said God created man um, as an image of himself. Um, so if there was, would you not suppose that second intelligent life form would also be created? If they're persons, I would say that would be an entailment. Um, because God is personal. And then if he created intelligent beings that are persons, I would say they would be in the image of God, yes. And uh, God might have a plan of salvation for those persons quite different from what he has on this planet. Uh, or some theologians have even speculated about multiple incarnations 
Um, that's a possibility. Uh, or maybe uh, this race of intelligent life never <coughs> fell into sin. And so isn't in need of redemption and salvation. We, we're here in the airy fairy realms of speculation. But theologically, I'm completely open to following the evidence where it leads. Yes. And yes, in the strike of the teacher. Okay, so let's say the universe does have a transcending cause. Why should we suppose that this, just off this argument of the fine tune, obviously, in the way it's going to make a difference, but it's, let's say it's a disembodied mind. Why would we suppose that it's, say, omnipotent, has those omni traits that God has and isn't a deistic conception? Right. Oh, my God. None of these <laughs> arguments that I have presented today would show that this being is omnipotent. Uh, in order to create a finite universe, you need to have enormous power, but I don't see any reason to think you would have to be omnipotent. In order to fine tune the universe, you would have to have enormous power, but I can't see that it would prove omnipotence. I think to get omnipotence, you'd have to run what philosophers call an ontological argument, which I did not do this morning. I chose to leave it out. I do think the ontological argument is sound, and that will give you omnipotence, but these other arguments won't. So, Quite honestly, I find this to be an attractive feature of the arguments. They're modest. They don't try to overextend themselves and prove too much. I, I concluded to things like a personal creator of the universe, a designer of the universe, a metaphysically necessary personal explanation or transcendent being behind the universe. Those are not theologically full-bodied <coughs> concepts of God but they're certainly enough to dislodge us from atheism. Uh, I want to go to someone else before repeating a question from the same person. Yes, in the half. Thank you. Uh, I have a couple of questions, but let me know if I should only ask one for the sake of Let's start one at a time, OK? I think we can take it most two and then go to others. So I imagine uh, that I've accepted um, the what it seems to me like the strongest of these arguments, that, um, that we need an explanation for this things that uh, and that that reason has to be transcendent. Um, how do we get from a transcendent cause to the idea that that cause would have anything in common with persons as we know them in this universe? Well, I, I did get to a personal being. Uh, yeah, I was very I, confused when you made that jump. I was confused. I, I was confused. Oh, you were confused. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 this argument was actually suggested to me by one of my students, um, which I thought was a brilliant insight. Uh, I, I had used the contingency argument simply to argue for a metaphysically necessary being, which is the explanation of the contingent universe. And this student said to me, how in the world could you get a contingent being, which doesn't have to exist, from a necessarily existing cause, unless that cause was endowed with freedom of the will, and therefore able to create a contingent effect? You see, if the cause is a mechanically operating, impersonal set of conditions, then if it necessarily exists, the effect should necessarily exist. And so, it seems to me this is a very powerful argument for the personhood of this first cause, that we have a contingent effect like the universe from a necessarily existing cause. Now, beyond that, that doesn't get you beyond deism. That, that gives you a personal transcendent creator of the universe. To get beyond that, you're going to need to couple it with other arguments, like the argument from the resurrection of Jesus. Follow up? So, um, okay, so I almost want to push back because I'm still not convinced, but it, just, it seems like a, to say that God has to be like us is a failure of imagination, but, but there's something I'd rather ask about instead. All right, so let's say I've, I've, I'm with you so far. Um, just, by the way, let me just say this. I don't think that God is like us. I think we're like him. Okay, that's, that's right. <laughs> you know, and that's what we were talking about. As a finite person, we're in his image in the sense that we also have <coughs> freedom of the will, rationality, self-consciousness, and so forth. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, so, let's 
say that having gone with you that far, that I, I balk at the idea of accepting the historical evidence for the resurrection, maybe citing some reason like um, it's too far, uh, our accounts are too far removed in time from the days of the crucifixion, or simply saying perhaps they've been distorted by retelling, or, or some other such uh, such mundane explanation for the inaccuracy of, or the potential inaccuracy of the historical evidence. So then let me say, um, maybe my neighbor is Muslim and brings equally plausible historical evidence, or, or some, or from some other group that's not Christian. Uh, how would you justify the idea that Christianity has a, it should be privileged over other explanations? That, this is a, a great question, and right at the heart of choosing among different theisms or different monotheisms. And what I would argue is that when you look at the evidence for the historical Jesus, it is vastly superior to the evidence, for example, for the historical Muhammad. Uh, the evidence that we have for Jesus is multiple independent sources that go back to within the first five years after his crucifixion. And what I'm talking about there is not the date of the Gospels or Paul's epistles in the New Testament themselves, but the traditions on which they rely. And we have these multiple independent sources behind the New Testament which historians compare with one another to reconstruct what actually happened. And they allow for precisely the factors that you mentioned, editorial uh, redaction by the authors, uh, legendary influences through retelling, uh, just factual errors, and yet, the majority of scholars who have investigated the historical Jesus in this way come up with these three facts that I've mentioned. By contrast, if I may, if you study the sources for the life of Muhammad, the earliest biography we have of Muhammad is about 150 years after his death. And we have only one. It's just one biography. The Quran doesn't have this sort of biographical information in it. So I think a very, very uh, interesting case could be made uh, contrasting the quest of the historical Jesus with the quest of the historical Muhammad. And I think you'll find, if you look into that, that the historical facts of Jesus are just vastly better established. Well, I shouldn't have probably picked a specific religion in that case. I didn't mean to turn this into a versus match. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but Basing the argument on traditions seems profoundly misguided when, for example, uh, the traditions of, of other religions are highly metaphorical. Why wouldn't Christianity be? For example, um, sometimes people talk about the church as the body of Christ. Yeah. Why shouldn't we understand the resurrection as a story to, to give a narrative? Sure. Those are all, again, legitimate questions. And uh, if you look at N.T. Wright's book that I quoted in my talk, The Resurrection of the Son of God, what Wright shows is that the, the notion of the resurrection in paganism, in Judaism, and in early Christianity always and without exception referred to the raising up of the remains of the dead person. That's not true about paganism. I mean, that's, oh, that's, a mis that's an incorrect fact. Well, uh, look at Wright's book. Are you referring to myths of dying and rising gods? Uh, well, for example, Osiris has nothing to do with the general resurrection. Yeah, and Osiris, the myths about Osiris have nothing to do with resurrection from the dead. This That's is, not true. Uh, you're, you're incorrect about that. Well, I, I think not. Uh, and again, uh, I could refer you to the literature on this. The, the notion that in ancient pagan mythology, you have these myths of dying and rising deities, is a view that characterized the scholarship of comparative religions at the late 19th, early 20th century, and is now almost universally rejected among scholars of comparative religion. When you look at the Osiris myths, Osiris doesn't come back to, to life. He, go, he lives on in the nether underworld, in, in the world of the departed dead. It is not comparable to Jewish beliefs in the resurrection of the dead person. And this is, um, this is um, really established well by a, a Swedish scholar named Trig Mettinger, who wrote a book on dying and rising gods in, in the ancient world. Uh, it's footnoted in my book, Reasonable Faith. 
And Mettinger tries to argue for myths of dying and rising gods in only the cases of Baal and a couple of other cases. But he says that the almost universal opinion of contemporary scholars today is that these uh, so-called myths of, pagan, of dying and rising deities in ancient paganism are not really resurrection accounts at all. They're quite different. So I'll have to cut it off there and, and refer you to the, the, the notes in Reasonable Faith where this is documented. Yes? Uh, this is to do with your uh, argument on morality. Yes. Uh, my question is, you said that, uh, that the explanation without doctrine of morality is that we are socially pushed to have morals and laws and such. Um, and I would argue that I agree with you, it is a social aspect, but it's more of self-preservation, which is one of our most basic instincts, that we have morality in our culture to self-preserve so that laws protect people. Uh, and I think that's a much more grounded argument rather than that we have a God that gave us morals, that morals come from self-preservation of the whole. Well, that was what I said in defense of premise two, that if God does not exist, objective moral values and duties would not exist. They would be the byproducts of biological evolution, as you say, uh, altruistic and cooperative behavior gives a species a better chance in the struggle for survival than if they go their own individual way as mavericks. And then on top of that, you get social conditioning layered on. Um, but that means that moral values and duties are not objective. They're not really true or binding. If the film of evolution were re -round, rewound and shot over again, very different creatures with very different set of values might have evolved. And who are we to say that we're right and they would be wrong? So it seems to me that on the view you're explaining, that just is the affirmation that if God does not exist, there are no objective moral values and duties. And I think that contradicts our moral experience in premise one, that uh, it really is wrong, for example, to kill little children, to torture children, wife abuse, uh, intolerance, and all, all the rest, as well as the many goods that there are, such as love, uh, open-mindedness, fair play, and so forth. So I just see no reason to deny what my moral experience teaches me with regard to premise one. Yes? Um, I would say, I would agree with that if in the reformulated universe if we started again and changed everything, that if, if that self-preservation is not so important, but I think they are objective because Self-preservation is what we're, what all of our laws, all of our morals are meant to do. They're meant to give us the best life, the longest life, the most uh, uh, prosperous life. Uh, so, if you if you reworked everything so that you know self-preservation wasn't as important, that might be true. But I think that any intelligent being would have self-preservation as one of the most basic. Well, of but but I I don't think you are are grasping the point that once you admit that. All you are offering is a kind of conditional um, obligation. See, if you want to preserve yourself, then you ought to cooperate and so forth. Now, of course, the psychopath who doesn't care can go ahead and murder and rape as he chooses on your view or the atheistic view. He does nothing morally wrong. He's just antisocial. He doesn't know what's in his best self-preservation or interest. And I think that's morally unconscionable. That's that's outrageous. I see no reason to, to affirm such a thing. I mean, if you had a good argument for moral relativism, that would be something else. But in the absence of some defeater of premise one, it seems to me we ought to go with our moral experience that, that there really are objectively binding and true values, and that these are not just the relative byproducts of social and biological evolution. Yes, down here. Yeah, but on that point, it would seem as though the reason that we're, we're choosing to, to accept this hypothesis based on an objective moral grounding is not because it's the best hypothesis or the closest to truth or the one that's the simplest, but because it's the one that makes us feel like No, no, I'm not, I'm not su suggesting that it's the one that makes us feel the best. I'm saying that we have moral perceptions. We perceive 
the intrinsic value of other persons, that it's wrong to be uh, cruel and intolerant. It's good to be loving. And in the absence of some defeater of that experience, I ought to believe that that's true. And I would say that any argument for moral skepticism will be based upon premises which are less evident than the existence of objective moral values themselves. So it would never be rational to go with moral skepticism. The existence of objective moral values and duties will always be, I think, more evidently true than the premises in an argument for skepticism. And I would finally say, my, my last point on this would be, that if you persist in denying the objective reality of moral values and duties, then one would have no reason to be a realist with respect to the external world of objects around us. There's no way that you can get outside your sense perceptions and prove that you're really here in a room of real flesh and blood people in a real physical universe rather than in the matrix with a virtual reality where you're a brain in a vat wired up with electrodes by a mad scientist to think you're here. You simply go with what your senses deliver to you in the absence of some defeater of them, in the absence of a reason to doubt them. And it's exactly the same with our perceptions of the moral realm. In the absence of a defeater, we're rational to accept our moral apprehensions in the same way that we're rational to accept our sensory perceptions of an external world. Um, Let's see. Yes, this gentleman. Yeah, I'm kind of interested. All your arguments are really well written, they well laid out. I have a real problem, and it goes back to the chap up there that's talking about E. S. Pagan. We're talking. This leads me into a Christian. Book. Which one? Uh, when we get to the argument about uh, Jesus. Yes, that's right. It does. Okay, then it forces me to leave that philosophy, and so I'm sitting here wondering. Well, that's all very good. I am believing God, but my God is a Christian God, so that's fine. But what about all of the other people and the pre-Christian gods? How does that God relate back to the God that you're describing in the two the final argument? Well, um, with respect to the first several arguments, really the first the, the, the six, those were fine. You, well, and they're common property yeah. to theists. Yeah. So I can Muslims, Jews, Christians, Deists have all expounded those arguments. Yeah, so then theoretically, uh, the, then it makes me wonder about the question of Jesus and the raising of uh, Jesus. Right. Uh, the, this would be the claim now that this God, which you've arrived at by means of these other arguments, has dramatically entered into human history to reveal himself more fully as to what he is like. And I think we have good grounds for thinking that God has decisively revealed himself in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, and he has shown that by raising him from the dead. Well, then, then, then my counter-argument for that is that if you take that religion, yes. then what happens to all of the other people that don't believe in Christ? Okay, the question then was, what about then all the other people who haven't believed in Christ? You're worried about their salvation, is that yes, right? Sir. All right. What I would say, and I think this is the teaching of the New Testament, is that God is a just and fair God, and he judges people on the basis of the information they have. So people say living outside the pale of the Christian message will not be judged on the basis of whether they believe in Christ, because they've never heard of him. They'll be judged on the basis of their response to God's revelation in nature and conscience, uh, and, and how they respond to that. Now, does that mean that people can be saved apart from Christ? Well, I don't think so. What it means is that the benefits of Christ's death on the cross can be applied to persons even though they don't have any conscious knowledge of Christ. They would be like the benefactors of a rich uncle who has left a will for them uh, and they never even knew he existed. They never knew they had this rich uncle in whose will they are and from whom they inherit this great benefit. But it is through his testament and will that they are now given these great riches. And in the same way, uh, I think anyone who is saved is saved only through Christ and his atoning death. But that doesn't mean 
that everyone who is saved through Christ has a conscious knowledge of Christ. Somebody who hasn't asked a question yet. Yes. Uh, there's a gentleman in the back who's been waiting for quite a while. Oh, all right. Thank you. Um, <laughs> is God the best explanation for the problem of evil? Is God the best explanation for the systems of honor killing, death penalty, or homosexuality? Okay, is I'm, God I'm not quite understanding. Say again, the, the best solution to the problem of evil, what? Is God the best explanation for the problem of evil? Is God the best explanation for the existence of honor killing, um, death penalty, or homosexuality? Is God the best explanation for the existence of natural disasters that happen without human will? Yeah. What I would say is that God is the best explanation for the evil or the badness of those things. Uh, and my argument would be like this. If God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist. Two, evil exists. Look at the honor killings. Look at the intolerance. Look at the hatred and the religious persecution in the world. These things are evil. Three, therefore, objective moral values and duties do exist. Some things are evil, from which it follows for, therefore, God exists. So paradoxically, I do think there's an argument for the existence of God from evil. But it's really not distinct from the moral argument. It's just appealing to examples of evil in order to justify premise one, that objective moral values and duties exist. So yes, I do think that although evil on a superficial level calls into question God's existence, on a deeper level, I think e evil actually proves God's existence. Because in the absence of God, these things wouldn't be evil. I, again, I want to take a question from somebody who hasn't asked a, a question yet. Yes? Uh, concerning the Christian morality, how do you respond to Frederick Nietzsche's um, critique of Christian morality? And, um, <clears throat> well, I think Nietzsche was correct in thinking that if God is dead, then nihilism is true. Nietzsche is one of the persons I will often quote in a, a lecture on the moral argument and how in the absence of God, we're ultimately landed in nihilism. But um, I don't think that Nietzsche was correct at all, that the ethics taught by Jesus are the ethics of a weakling uh, and a patsy. I believe that the ethics of Jesus require enormous moral strength and fire to live out to not, for example, retaliate against those who abuse you or persecute you, but to bless them and pray for them, to love your enemies. I, I think the ethic of Jesus is just incredibly challenging. It takes a great deal of courage and strength. So I, I think that Nietzsche was just utterly wrong in thinking that Christianity's uh, ethics is, is a system of weaklings and, uh, and subservient people. That is, I think that's just patently wrong. <clears throat> yes? Uh, I'd like to ask about your second question, uh, that God is the best explanation for the origin of the universe? Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know if that's Okay, well, we have concluded in the syllogism that, uh, that the cause of the universe would have to be transcendent, aspatial, and atemporal. Yes. Um, and then you had said that this, uh, this could have to be an abstract object or an unbodied mind. Yes. So you, they could be abstract objects because they don't have any causal relations. Very good. Uh, but mind, I, I thought that minds, if you conceive them as entities that have temporal successions of thoughts and they make choices in time, uh, then they cannot be atemporal. So how are we to conceive of atemporal minds? All right. Very good question. I have devoted a chapter in my book, Time and Eternity, to the question of atemporal personhood. Does it make sense to talk about a person or a mind which is timeless? And it seems to me that this is a perfectly coherent idea. I cannot find a good argument uh, that would show that a person must be temporal. What is essential to personhood? Well, things like self-consciousness, freedom of the will, and rationality. It seems to me that any being possessing those three pro properties would be a person. But none of those requires temporality. 
Uh, you don't have to be in time to know something. Uh, knowing a proposition doesn't take time. You can know P, if for a proposition P, in an instant. Similarly, um, as long as God's states of consciousness are not changing, there's no reason to think that there would need to be succession or a stream of consciousness. It would simply be a changeless state, uh, a mental state of consciousness. And this can be free in the sense that we could imagine logically possible worlds or other possible worlds in which this being uh, is different or does, does things differently. So I would say that there's any incoherence in the idea of a personal being which is changeless and therefore a temporal. What chapter of what book was that? Time and Eternity is the name of it. And it's in the section where I look at arguments for divine temporality. Because some philosophers have argued that God must be temporal precisely for the reason you mentioned. And what I do is I look at that chapter and I show either that the properties of personhood that they're discussing are not really essential to personhood. Like, for example, deliberation. Deliberation takes time. I don't think that's essential to personhood. A being which is omniscient doesn't need to deliberate, right? Because he already knows everything. So deliberation is an essential to personhood. And those properties that are essential to personhood, like freedom of volition, self-consciousness, and rationality, are not inherently temporal. So in that chapter, I argue that those who argue that God must be temporal have failed to carry their case. So that's in the book, Time and Eternity. Yes? You mentioned a theorem that was the basis for one of the arguments. Yes. And I've never heard of the theorem. It's quite new. Can you tell us a little bit more? Right. Is this it, was a theorem. Is it accepted in the community? Yes. Yes, it is. Uh, you can look at, in more detail at the book that I co-edited with J.P. Moreland called The Blackwell Companion to Natural Theology. And in there, we have a 100-page article on the cosmological argument which is I co-authored with a physicist named James Sinclair. And James does a very nice job of laying out the vord guth vilenkin theorem and its implications. And he points <coughs> out that the theorem is now widely accepted in the physics community today. Um, and so those who want to hold that the universe is past eternal have to try to find some way around the theorem. They can't deny the truth of the theorem, namely that if the universe has on average been in a state of cosmic expansion throughout its history, it must have a past space-time boundary. And so there have been very valiant attempts to try to craft models that will get around the board group Vilenkin theorem. And these are what Vilenkin surveyed in this talk at Stephen Hawking's celebrity uh, birthday uh, conference in Cambridge last April. By the way, that Valenkin talk is on YouTube. If you will Google on YouTube or, or put in uh, Alex Valenkin, it'll bring up his talk at the Cambridge Conference, and it is very accessible. It has a nice PowerPoint, and he gives a very nice explanation of the theorem and its implications. <clears throat> All right, any other uh, question? Yes, wait here in the back, yes. At the beginning of your talk, um, you were describing a, a kind of renaissance of uh, belief in God in philosophy departments? Yes. And my, my question is, why is it that at our philosophy department, there are many philosophy departments that I, I've heard of in the US, yeah. um, theists are in the minority, it seems? Oh, not, now, I never suggest they were in the majority. Remember, I, I said in the talk, atheism, though probably still the dominant viewpoint at the university, is a philosophy in retreat. But that's not to suggest that theists are the majority. They are now a respected minority. They have a place at the table. Uh, they are treated with respect and, 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 all, and participate in the professional life of the American Philosophical Association, the Canadian Philosophical Association, and uh, journals like Philosophy, 
Canadian Journal of Philosophy, uh, in which I've even published, uh, and they publish with the best um, presses. Now, I don't know what the department here at Simon Fraser is like. Uh, I frankly don't know the men in the department here. So I can't speak to that, but I do know many of my colleagues in the United States and in England are teaching at our finest, most prestigious universities. And let me just give some names. Uh, people like Brian Leptow and Richard Swinburne at Oxford University, Robert Adams at University of North Carolina, Dean Zimmerman at Rutgers, Clinton Merrick at Virginia, Eleanor Stump at St. Louis, uh, Peter Van Inwagen, and uh, until lately, Alvin Plantinga at the University of Notre Dame, Dallas Willard at USC. Uh, the presence of Christian philosophers in this community is, as Quentin Smith uh, indicated, uh, uh, now a respectable, respected rather, force to be reckoned with in the community. So uh, we can only hope that uh, this same revolution will continue here in Canada as well. Yes? Um, earlier about the, the objective moral argument, I was, I was thinking about it, and I find it rather concerning when I think about the term objective and how, I guess, it's rather it's man unanimously agreed that the moral values that are represented with the existence of God and the biblical interpretation of moral values, that they are moral, but I cannot bring myself to um, uh, to realize that, well, and I guess I find it as a contradiction that if it's an objective moral, uh, if it is an objective moral value, then how can it there be such contradiction contradictions amongst humans that don't you know conform to those moral values? All right, this is a great question. He says, look at the moral diversity right in the world and the controverted moral questions, things like abortion, euthanasia, uh, the use of drones to target. American citizens, things of this, there are all kinds of difficult moral questions. Here it is absolutely crucial that we distinguish between two areas of moral philosophy. One is called moral ontology. The other is moral epistemology. Moral ontology is about the reality of moral values and duties. Moral epistemology is about how we come to know moral values and duties. My argument is exclusively an argument about moral ontology. And to say that there are objective moral values and duties is to make no claim at all that these are clear and easy to discern, that moral epistemology is easy. It, I'm not at all. There are huge areas of gray where it's hard to discern what is right or wrong in a certain situation. So to say that there are objective moral values and duties is not to say that ethics is easy and that moral epistemology is clear. Certainly there will be clear examples. We should treat human beings as intrinsically valuable rather than as means to be used for an end. It is wrong to rape and torture a little girl. Uh, those are clear, but in between there will be all these gray and difficult areas that require moral reflection. So my argument for the existence of God is that we need God to ground moral ontology. Is that, is that clear? And, and that is not to make any sort of claim about God's role in moral epistemology. Yes? Yeah, I wanted to ask you about freedom of the will because I just don't feel like it's been touched on enough. And it seems really integral to this continuity that seems to exist between an, uh, a, a, a godlike being and a human because they're both sort of atemporal sort of entities in that sort of And I look, at, um, I look at most philosophy departments, I recently read a survey, and it says that like, most philosophers these days tend to view a compatibilistic, sort of view a free will and uh, causality as being kind of it seems to be the most popular right now. Yes. And so I just wondered what sort of like objective facts there are that support the free will or libertarian hypothesis. Okay, this is a great question. What our question here points out is that in most philosophy departments, people are determinists. And they think that we have freedom only in the sense 
that you voluntarily do what you're determined to do in many cases. But it's not as though you have what's called libertarian freedom to act differently than the way you, in fact, do act. Now, I think that the reason for the dominance of determinism is physicalism or materialism. They are determinists because they're physicalists. They don't believe that there is a mind or soul distinct from the body. And I would agree with them on that. I think if you are not a dualist with regard to mind and body, then you are going to be stuck with determinism. But determinism flies in the face, I think, of our experience as human beings, where we do experience ourselves as free agents. And I think that determinism is even perhaps rationally unaffirmable, because to affirm determinism, you have to admit that you're just determined to believe in it. That you haven't done so by freely weighing the arguments for and against. It's just like growing uh, to, or having a toothache that you came to believe in determinism. So, I think there are real problems with determinism, and, and especially with physicalism. And the argument that I gave about states of intentionality, I think would probably be one of the most powerful reasons to be a dualist. If you are a physicalist, then I think as Alex Rosenberg rightly sees, you can't really say that we have thoughts about anything. Because brain states, are not about things. Physical objects aren't about things. There is no intentionality. So that would mean there is no intentionality. Therefore, there is no meaning to sentences. Therefore, there is no truth, because they're all meaningless. And you get yourself into a self-referentially incoherent bog uh, as a result of denying that there, are, there is a real self, a real mental subject distinct from the body. So, while this isn't my area of expertise, um, I'm persuaded by the arguments of people like my colleague J.P. Moreland that uh, as human persons, we are not just electrochemical machines. We are selves, we are souls, we are minds who are intimately <coughs> connected with this physical body. Um, yes, maybe back. Um, your talk is entitled the, you know, the, the reasonability of faith in God. And what you've given us is a handful of concerns for which uh, theism seems to be the best explanation. Um, let's just suppose I grant you all of that for right now. That, that, oh, oh, but pardon I'm going to grant you everything you've given today. That yes. theism is the best explanation of all these points. And my question is how you get from there to the reasonability of belief or faith in God. And, and let me explain why it's might not be as simple a question as you might think. Um, two reasons. One is that for each of these eight points, it seems to me that the closest naturalistic competing explanation isn't terribly far behind. I don't have time to defend that claim, I'll just kind of assert it. Uh, facts about the resurrection, for example. You, you, you mentioned that, the, that there is no plausible naturalistic explanation of these facts. That strikes me as an overstated claim. That, that if we were to look at the most plausible naturalistic explanation, it may not be as best as the theistic one, but it's not terribly far behind. The, the, the second concern is that we could look at a handful of similar concerns or features of our experience for which theism really isn't the best explanation. We could yes. look at facts about biological evolution, about evil, about uh, the rationality of other things. Uh, again, I'm not going to defend these claims, but it seems to me that we could look at a bunch of features for which it just doesn't seem that theism is the best explanation. So at the end of it, it looks to me like the best you get is the rationality of a theistic leaning agnosticism, that maybe I'm slightly on that side of the fence. Uh -huh. How do you get from there to, to belief or faith in God, or is that enough for faith in God? I, I think that's enough, frankly. But I wouldn't agree with what you said, that the case for the other side is as powerful as you portrayed it, nor that the naturalistic explanations are not as far behind as you think they are. I mean, for example, the argument about states of intentionality, in the absence of, of theism, I think that naturalism is just at a complete loss with regard to states of intentionality or the applicability of mathematics. <coughs> Naturalists admit they, they have no explanation or why anything at all exists. Naturalists simply say the universe exists inexplicably. So 
I don't think that I'm ready to grant your first point that the naturalistic explanations are not far behind. And then, you're quite right in saying, I have only looked at one side of the ledger today. I haven't talked about things on the other side, though we did mention the problem of evil. But in my published work, at least, I, I do look at the arguments on the other side, and I try to show that they are not um, that powerful, so that on balance, we have very good grounds for believing, I think, in, in the God revealed by Jesus of Nazareth. Now, suppose, though, that you just think it's slightly more plausible than not, well, I'm, I'd be happy with that. I think that'd be great. Uh, and therefore, on that basis, you should place your faith in, in God and say, with the man who came to Jesus and said, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. God understands our, our doubts and our struggles, and, um, and I, I think we come to admit them. So although I think these arguments are very powerful and persuasive, uh, don't think that in order to become a Christian you have to think, agree with me on that score. I, I think it's great if a person comes to God uh, <coughs> with all of his doubts and uncertainties and so forth. Yes? I actually think that the, the Calanthus Rochby argument is a very strong argument, but I think that the first premise, the causal principle, is rejected by some <coughs> philosophers on epistemological grounds. Now, would you, what, would you clarify your position as to how would you as a theist uh, are able to accept the plausibility of the causal principle um, yeah. rather than, you know, let's say, natural human embraces and Well, now, that all depends on what you mean by the causal principle. You notice in this formulation that's on the screen of this argument, the second premise <coughs> doesn't enunciate some general causal principle. It doesn't assert everything has a cause. It doesn't assert every event has a cause. It doesn't even assert, in this case, everything that begins to exist has a cause, though I, I think that's true. It simply makes the claim, if the universe began to exist, then the universe has a cause, a transcendent cause. Now, why would I think that? What defense might I give? Number one would be, something can't come from nothing. In order for the universe to come into being, as the beginning of space and time, matter, and energy, it would have to be something coming from nothing. And I think if there's anything that is a metaphysical first principle, it is that out of nothing, nothing comes. Mm -hmm. That you've got to have some actual entity that is the cause. Secondly, if you do think that things can come into being out of nothing, without a cause, then it becomes inexplicable why just anything and everything doesn't pop into being out of nothing, without a cause. Why doesn't Beethoven and root beer and bicycles just pop into being from nothing, without causes? There can't be anything about nothingness that would prevent this, because nothingness has no properties. It has no powers. So why is nothingness so discriminatory? Why is it only the universes that supposedly pop into being out of nothing? And then my third reason would be an inductive one, namely that the principle that something cannot come out of nothing is universally verified in our experience and never falsified. And so on those three grounds, I think we have very good reasons for thinking this second premise is true. You want to follow up? Yeah, I was talking about the standard formulation of the Calan Christmas argument. You're, you're talking about what? The, the standard like presentation that you Yeah, you yeah, OK. And but whereas Peter Millikan, for example, as an empiricist, has some reservations about that. But my concern was about what the, the, the sort of the, the, the distinction between the both of you in terms of your own epistemology. He's an he's more of an empiricist, yeah. Peter Millikan. Mm -hmm. But what's your position, as, you know, as as a, as a philosopher? Um, <clears throat> I don't carry any sort of brief for a certain sort of epistemology. That's not my area of specialization. Um, I think that there are metaphysically necessary truths, that some of these are plausibly known a priori, but others might be known a posteriori. That is to say, some might be known on the basis of experience, others might be known simply by conceptual reflection. Um, but 
I think that the three arguments that I gave for the truth of the causal principle behind this argument are more than sufficient to justify believing its premises. And, and with that, I rest content. Yes, in the blue. Um, if God is the best explanation of a lot of things, is there an explanation of God? Why is God? This will depend, uh, the question was, in case you didn't hear it, if God is the best explanation of the contingent universe, then uh, is there an explanation of God? I think that depends on how you formulate the premises of this argument. As I have formulated it here, God would not have an explanation because the first premise states that every contingent thing has an explanation of its existence. That is to say, if it is possible for a thing not to exist, if there's a possible world in which that thing does not exist, and yet it does exist, there's an explanation why this world is actual rather than that one. And in, in that case, a being that exists in all possible worlds, like God, a necessary being just wouldn't have an explanation. So on this very modest principle of sufficient reason, only a contingent reality needs an explanation, not a metaphysically necessary one. Now, I think you can recast the argument in another way in which I've defended it, where you could say, Everything that exists has an explanation of its existence, either in the necessity of its own nature or in an external cause. And in that case, a necessarily existing being would have an explanation of its existence, namely, it exists by a necessity of its own nature. You, you would regard the necessity of its own nature as explanatory. And then contingent things would have causes. And I think that's an also acceptable formulation of the premise, but it's slightly more complicated, and so for simplicity of presentation, uh, I go with this one today. Yes. Oh, two, two questions more. Uh, one more question. One more question. All right. So anyone who hasn't asked one. Yes. Yes. You, you've referenced uh, science a lot today in yes. certain arguments, science and science and that, but um, if science, modern science, you know, Newton, Copernicus, Galileo, didn't come in until you know, 1,000, 1,100, 1,200 years after the existence of Jesus and after the Bible was written. Can we use theology and um, to explain every modern scientific phenomena, such as, um, like, you know, we talk about weather disasters, really, natural weather, and, 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 and can we use modern science to explain something that existed before it? Yeah. I would not go that route. I think that's very dangerous. Uh, and the reason I say it is, is because you're apt to either distort the science or you're apt to read things into these ancient documents that the author didn't intend. So I think that what is correct to say, and I, I think my presentation today exemplifies this, is that as a Christian thinker and believer, I do want to have an integrated view of reality that takes seriously all of the sources of knowledge. Theology, science, mathematics, logic, history, and literature, psychology, and we want to develop a kind of synoptic world and life view, which is integrated and coherent. And so, yes, in that sense, I endorse this project. I, um, and I think you've seen today how some of that integration might go. For example, the applicability of mathematics to the, the world, how that looks on theism as opposed to naturalism, or how the origin of the universe looks on theism rather than on naturalism. But that's a very different project from trying to read modern science back into the Bible or trying to impose biblical teachings on modern science. Rather, you let each one uh, stand on its own, and then you try to integrate these into a coherent world and life view. <coughs> and that is the worldview that I would commend to all of you. I can say honestly as a Christian that Christianity not only meets the needs of my heart, but it also meets the needs of my head. And I think it stands intellectually head and shoulders above any other worldview or ism that you might want to embrace today. And so I hope that you will consider it 
uh, for yourselves. Thank you very much.